We have navigated this virtual week from our living rooms, our gardens, all over the world, really. It was a first for all of us. We've been, we're used to going to Aspen and giving each other hugs and meeting at the hub and getting an espresso and sort of breath of oxygen because we can't breathe. But we've been focused this week and we've done it well on the fierce urgency of now. Now for our climate, now for gender equality, now for economic inclusion, and now for race. But we also acknowledge that these require a multi-generational approach. We can't address these issues alone, and we can't address them without having a long-term view. In the upcoming session, we will hear from leaders from multiple generations and reflect on how the fierce urgency of now can expand and even transcend generations. We're joined by Secretary Madeleine Albright, a woman of lots of firsts and obviously needs no introduction. Welcome, Madeleine. Salvador Gomez Colon, a 17-year-old youth activist whom I can only call a dynamo of the new generation. And finally, Henry Crown Fellow and McNulty Laureate Kelsey Wirth, co-founder and chair of Mothers Out Front. Welcome. And I'm gonna use Secretary Albright um, as a start for this discussion. I remember reading that you discovered a journal among your father's papers that belonged to your maternal grandmother, Rusena Spieglova, who died during the Holocaust and was written for your own mother. You have described this journal like putting a message in a bottle, putting down words to paper in the hopes that someday someone would find it. Today, we're asking you to write your own message to the future. And your letter begins, dear great great grandchildren, what would it say about the world you hope for them? and your role in creating it. Hildegard, thank you. And I'm delighted to be a part of this with Salvador and Kelsey and all the other great people that have been part of the Action Forum. Well, let me say that um, it was a surprise for me to find that journal and to understand it and then to put it at the end of a book that I wrote called Hell and Other Destinations, uh, which really describes the kinds of things that I've been doing now and so fits into a lot of what I would say to the next uh, generation. Uh, I think that um, we really do need to understand that terrible things have happened in the past and we have to learn from those and yet at the same time have very much an approach that we can do something different uh, in the future. Uh, and that we need to understand the past, but need to look forward. I am just getting ready to teach. And so in some ways <clears throat> I have written this kind of a letter. <clears throat> and what I have said to my students is that <clears throat> we are now in a, one of the most difficult phases that we have witnessed, which is a pandemic, uh, desperate economic problems, the displacement of a lot of people, systemic racism, and I said that mother, we must have made mother nature really, really angry given what is going on with the climate. But I also have seen the talents of young people who are, um, I think, amazing in terms of, and I have to say, Salvador, listening to your story, you're an example of this, um, who are calm and at the same time determined and really do wanna do something for others, not they have been, this generation has been described as selfish. That's ridiculous. That is the opposite of what they are. Uh, and while in fact uh, they are isolated in some ways, I think they are letting their imagination go forward, that they understand that terrible things have happened and that they are a generation that can do something. Uh, one of my favorite, you know, people quote Robert Frost all the time. And one of my favorite, uh, quotes is, the older I am, the younger are my teachers. So I hesitate writing a letter to tell me, to, for me to tell them what to do, 
when in fact, I think they are telling us what to do. Uh, and I do think that they understand better than all is that democracy is not a spectator sport and that they really have to be a part of it. So my letter would end with great love and hope. And so just go get them guys. Thank you. Salvador. Of course. So in terms of, I mean, I haven't even graduated from high school yet, but if I were writing to my great grandchildren, the first thing that I would say is that I hope by then we have a world that values consideration over self-interest. I think there needs to be a reminder that goes off on everyone's phone that reminds us for the need of inspirational leadership. And I mention it because it's something that I am not seeing much of today. I think every single leader needs to ask themselves, how are my actions impacting someone else's tomorrow? And the reason why we ask this is because leadership is not about oneself or ego, but about others. You know, if we can't identify someone whom we are helping uplifting or inspiring, then we're doing it wrong. So for inspirational leadership to make sense, we need our actions to inspire good beyond our peers and organizations. And there's nothing better than having values so fantastic that others want to emulate them. The second thing is that we have a world that values courage over cowardice. And I know this is a strong juxtaposition, but it's exactly what we need to think about. This year's theme of the fierce urgency of now is no surprise. We're living an extremely tumultuous time and a convergence point in our history where our societal fabrics are unraveling and we are failing to keep up. So it's no surprise that people are evading responsibility for the magnanimous challenges that we face. But for posterity's sake and for our sake, I hope we're able to have the courage and moral leadership to recognize where we have fallen short and what we must do going forward. And the final point that I have in my letter is that we value inclusion over isolation. This also has to do with the challenge that we're facing right now. The problems we're facing, like the COVID-19 pandemic, anti-Black racism, the climate crisis, et cetera, are all human challenges that affect all of us on this planet. And we have to think about it as a ship that is sinking and we need all hands on deck. That's why we need to foster coalition building, bringing youth to take action, meaningful action within their communities and beyond, because the problems we face today should not be the burden of tomorrow's generation. And what I write there about the role I have to play is that I hope they know that I've done all I could. I hope they know that I didn't wait until I graduated from college, high school even, to, to begin taking action and engaging others. <laughs> well, I told you he was a dynamo. <laughs> Thank you, Salvador. Um, of course. Kelsey, what would, what would yours um, say? Well, I wanna take a step back for just a, just a second and um, say that this was really a for me, a painful and heartbreaking question to reflect on as I can only think about it in the context of the climate crisis. And the reality of the climate crisis forces us all to question the very assumption that we will have great, great grandchildren to receive our letter. Um, so just, you know, today here in the US, the Louisiana Gulf region is experiencing one of the strongest hurricanes to ever strike this country. There are over 650 fires burning in California. Um, millions of people are being told to keep their windows closed and not go outside in this country because of the toxic air quality. And all of you tuning in from around the world have similar stories about the climate impacts in your, in your countries. And last week, we all learned that the Greenland ice sheet, currently the largest contributor to rising sea levels has melted past the point of no return. This is what the world is experiencing with a one degree Celsius increase in global temperature caused by human activity. And if we remain on our current path, if we fail to act with great urgency, by the time my grandchildren are my children's age, by around mid-century, we'll be experiencing a three degree Celsius increase in global temperature. At that point, just to give you one picture, over a billion people will live in parts of the planet where it will be impossible to safely work outside. That's the lives of my grandchildren. So my great-great-grandchildren would theoretically be born somewhere toward the end of the century. And if we fail to act with great urgency today, by then we'll be experiencing a five or six degree Celsius increase in temperatures. That is not a world any of us 
can even imagine, let alone want our great, great grandchildren to live in. So the farthest I can go with this question is to think about a letter to my children and perhaps, perhaps my grandchildren. And this letter would have to start with a statement that my generation took responsibility and acted before it was too late. And based on our having taken action, then here's what I would say. The world I hope for them is one where we have transitioned away from our current white supremacist systems and practices that rely on exploitation and abuse of people and place to equitable regenerative systems that invest in people that are powered by clean and renewable forms of energy and that protect the natural systems we all rely on for our health and well-being. My hope is that my children and grandchildren live in a society that is reckoning with its past, how we have treated people and nature and is working with great urgency to create a more just and equitable society, society and a healthier planet. And my hope personally is that my children and grandchildren live in a world where they can find joy in nature as we do now in our family, whether in the mountains of Colorado or the beaches of Cape Cod, and that allows them to discover new beautiful places. And my hope is that they feel enough hope about their world that they would wanna bring children into it. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, I feel the pain in what you're saying. And I think it's important for everybody else to feel that pain. You're, you're all at different stages of your life, and your life's work, and your legacy. And the, from you, where you sit right now in your life story. And I wanna bring love into this uh, because I think love is, is important. How has love compelled you to enter and stay in this arena and fight for a better future? Salvador? Sure. Um, so my work began as, as a result of love and compassion after Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico in 2017. And I was extremely unsettled and I understood the widespread suffering and hardship that the island was facing, but I didn't let it end there. I tied that empathy with action. And this is exactly the concept that keeps me in the running today. That's why I continue to do my work to promote climate resilience for vulnerable communities and continue to engage youth and empower them Take, to take action. Because if we have the privilege and the position to be able to do something, then empathy without action is sort of meaningless. Because we have to go beyond, I understand how you feel and start moving towards, I understand how you feel. This is what I'm going to do to make it better. When we think about it, I mean, some astronauts have described this thing of the overview effect, which is when they go up to space and they see just this pale blue dot hanging in the balance of this vast space there's a sense of responsibility that comes with that. And I think we all need to embody that sense of responsibility for each other. And when we add that aspect of our tangible response to those feelings, we change the game, which is exactly what I seek to embody. Madeline? Well, um, let me say that I'm clearly the oldest person. Um, and um, I was recently asked to describe myself in six words. And so I said, worried optimist, problem solver, grateful American. I came to the United States when I was 11 years old from uh, Czechoslovakia. We had spent World War II in London during the Blitz and then had to escape communism uh, in 1948 and came here. And so I have thought all the time about how to repay my gratitude uh, because it has been the, the lodestar of my life to be able to do something to make sure that others have opportunities in a number of different ways. And so what I have done uh, is to try to work to be the problem solver in terms of getting young people involved through teaching. Uh, I am chairman of the board of a wonderful organization called the National Democratic Institute that um, was based on something, frankly, that President Reagan talked about, about how democracy can explain itself at that time vis-a-vis -vis communism. But I do think that doing things to make sure that 
everybody in the world has a chance to choose the governments that they want and to live by the rule of law and to have opportunities so that they don't have to try to escape their countries or um, not be able to, to live in, in a proper way of any kind. Um, I do try through my activities and a lot of them are political because I do think, as I said, democracy is not a spectator sport. And I do think that I hope that my legacy is that I put all my efforts into um, making sure that others can have good lives, that it is a morality to it, that it's decent, and that we are able to really recognize the resiliency uh, of democracy uh, and the resiliency of the American people. Uh, and I do think it took me an awful long time to find my voice, uh, and I'm not gonna be quiet now. And so I do think that one has to work with intention to make things better and to go back to the first set of questions to know where we've come from and why we can't we don't want to live in the kind of a world that some of us came from and that we need to do the kinds of things that both uh, Salvador and Kelsey are talking about in terms of looking to the future and being uh, realistic but also idealistic uh, and really push 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 to make sure that we understand the past and are willing to use love, love for each other and inclusion in order to make a better world for the next generations. Thank you. Elsie? Um, so it was my love of my children um, who led to my founding Mothers Out Front. And it is mothers' love of their children and of all children um, that really drives all of the work that we do. And we see our job as to translate that love into a fierce and unstoppable force for change. Um, and every, as, as, as one of our active mothers once said, um, a mother's love is the most powerful renewable source of energy that there is. And that is what we are tapping into um, all across all across this country. Thank you. So, you know, are we, we're considering as a community, the commitments and accountability that uh, we want to leave for the future generations. What would be your call to action to all the leaders gathered here today, as we end this action forum? Who is that directed at Hildegard? Um, Kelsey, you can start. Okay, sorry. Oh. Um, so my call to action to everyone gathered here is that you first recognize the climate crisis for the urgent crisis that it is, and that you commit to being climate champions in your lives. I think you are all part of some institution, whether it's the company or organization you started or are on the board of or otherwise invested in. Um, and we know that from scientific consensus that we have to transform our economy and reduce our use of fossil fuels by 50% in the next 10 years to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And we all have a role to play in this. So I ask each of you out of love for our kids and our grandkids to do all you can to push your institution or institutions to recognize the climate crisis for the urgent crisis that it is and to take concrete action to address it. Thank you. Salvador? Sure, so to be very direct, I think that we should all embrace young people as meaningful allies to create change and social impact. And we need to listen to younger generations to be able to create change. But I think listening to young people has to go beyond mere tokenizing. We need to bring youth to, to the table. And I say we because I feel uncomfortable using second person, but I'm talking about adults and people who are in charge right now and in positions of power. Um, we need to start fostering or continue fostering intergenerational collaboration to solve the problems we face. And this includes this idea that I have of reverse mentoring. Um, and mentoring is usually seen as this like vertical hierarchy 
I mean, vertical hierarchy, but it's actually horizontal. Um, I think through reverse mentoring, adults with experience can be fueled by youth idealism, which is great to hear Secretary Albright mentioned because I feel like a lot of members of previous generations think of idealism as something attributed to my generation, but also very unrealistic. Um, but in my perspective, that, be, although it's seen as unrealistic, that factor of idealism, ideas, idealism gives us something to which we can aspire. And aspiration is exactly what gives leaders value. So if we can foster that idealism and that aspiration, um, then we'll be much better off. So I hope that all of you here today make yourself, your organization, or your sector recognize value and potential you can harness by bringing youth to the table. Well, I, I really do think that what is very important is to recognize the fact that we have to do something now. It is not a matter of saying, well, I've just had an interesting time in Aspen or virtually, uh, but that this has to happen now. Uh, and that it does have to be intergenerational. I fully agree with that. I think that one of the problems with people my age is we say, well, the youth is great, let them do it. Uh, and that can't happen. And the youth can say, well, you people screwed this all up, so go away. Um, but I do think that there needs to be this intergenerational aspect to it. And I, and I uh, really treasure what Salvador said in terms of the reverse mentoring or how we kind of try to figure out how to do things together. I also do think that we can't wait. I know, Kelsey, that people think, well, uh, climate change is not happening now. And especially because I think the scientists aren't always saying cause and effect when it's very uh, visible today. And I think it is happening now. And so we can't just kind of say, well, we'll put this off. And so I do think the immediacy of all this, and I've been to a lot of action forums we can't leave our pledges just at this meeting. Uh, it has to be something that we recognize has to be active, has to happen now, has to be cross-generational. We have to listen to each other's generation and not blame each other or say, why are we so slow to do things? I think we just have to get going and do it. And that would be uh, my main message. And the cross-generational part, I really uh, treasure because I do think that that is where somebody my age can actually be useful. Thank you. Thank you all you three for participating in this panel. Um, we don't have a circle, so I would give you a group hug, but we can't, so I'm sending you a hug of love. Thank you very much. Thank you, it was great. <laughs>